All right, so next up in Unit 5, we're going to talk about Section 5.4. So, so far up to this point, we've talked in 5.1 about classifying triangles. In 5.2, we talked about determining the corresponding parts of congruent triangles. In 5.3, we talked about the five congruency tests I can use to determine if two triangles are congruent. And so now 5.4, we've all kind of been leading up into this section where I'm going to be writing proofs to show the two triangles are going to be congruent. So as I'm getting ready to write these proofs, there is a five-step process that I do need to be aware of. Now, this five-step process, first, we need to label our picture, okay? So our picture is going to give us uh, some kind of a congruency statement. It's going to be best for us to go ahead and label the picture so we know exactly what we're working with, okay? So step two, the first statement in your proof should be your first given, and the reason should be given. So if you recall back to unit three, when we talk about reasoning and logic, we did write some algebraic proofs, some proofs uh, centered around segments, and some proofs centered around angles. So now we're once again going to revisit writing proofs, but this time it's going to be more in the context of thinking about with triangles. So one thing that's going to be different in these proofs is that with these triangle proofs, you may have multiple given statements. Okay, so with the ones we've dealt with in the past in unit three, they only had one given statement. But for these triangle proofs, they could have two or even three given statements that we can work with to, in order to help us determine if these two triangles can be congruent. So after that, we're going to try to reach a congruency. Okay, so reaching a congruency can be either determining the two sides are congruent or two angles are congruent. Okay, so we're going to try to reach a congruency with each of our given statements. Okay, so once we've used up all of our givens, if we don't have an example of two triangles be congruent yet, then I need to look for one of two things. Either look for a reflexive side or a pair of vertical angles. Okay, so keep in mind, a reflexive side was a side of two triangles that they both share. Okay, so this is like in the case of where if we had two triangles that were conjoined at one side, that one side was the reflexive side. And then a pair of vertical angles came about when we had two intersecting lines. Two intersecting lines created those vertical angles. So if when we're dealing with our pictures here, if we have a reflexive side or if we have a pair of vertical angles, we know automatically then that we have a congruency because a reflexive side automatically means that we're going to have a pair of congruent sides between two triangles. And then a pair of vertical angles means that we're going to have a pair of congruent angles between two triangles. So once we have reached three congruencies, that's the magic number, three, we can then determine if the triangles are congruent by one of our five tests, side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, 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 side, and hypotenuse leg. Okay, so again, we need three congruencies because each one of these tests calls for three parts, three congruent parts. Okay, so side, side, side means you have to have three congruent sides, side, angle, side, two congruent sides, and the angle in between them, and so on and so forth. Even hypotenuse leg requires three congruent things. The hypotenuse is to be congruent. One set of corresponding legs have to be congruent. And they both have to have right angles. So remember, hypotenuse leg only works for right triangles. So that's why we have to have three congruencies to determine if two triangles are congruent. Okay, so let's get into actually writing these proofs. Okay, so you should have your little triangle books here. And we're going to start on page one. Okay, so it should say page one down at the bottom and up at the top, it should say side, 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 proof number one. Okay, so looks very similar to proofs we've written in the past. You're going to have a statement column and a reasons column. So we are given to start with segment PQ is congruent to segment ST, segment QR is congruent to segment TR, and R is the midpoint of segment PS. So we're given three givens from the beginning, three given statements. And so with all that, we are asked to prove then that triangle PQR is congruent to triangle STR. And keep in mind that they are ordering it in a very specific way, such that angle P would correspond to angle S, angle Q to angle T, angle R to angle R, and then PQ to ST, QR to TR, and PR to SR. So they are naming those two triangles in a very specific way to get the corresponding parts to line up. So luckily for us, we do have all the options down here at the bottom. So it makes it a little bit easier for us to write this proof. So let's get into it. So 
when writing our proofs, we're always going to use our, our given statement first. And in this specific case, we have three given statements. So we'll put our first given statement, PQ is here in ST. That'll be our first statement. Our first reason, it's given. Okay. So the key difference with unit five proofs with triangles and unit three proofs with, with reasoning and logic is going to be that as we give a given statement, we need to be thinking, is there anything else that I can pull from that given statement? Is there anything else that that given statement tells me? So with this one, PQ is congruent to ST, really there's nothing else that, that tells me. That, that tells me this side is congruent to this side, but that's about it. So let's move on. The next one, QR is congruent to TR. That'll be our second statement. The reason we have that statement is that it was given to us. Again, QR, TR, that's two sides that are currently congruent. In fact, let me mark these just so we make sure that we are keeping up with this. Okay, so, so far, we have said that PQ is congruent to ST. And we've now said that QR is congruent to TR. Okay? So, now, next given statement. R is the midpoint of segment PS. Okay? That'll be our third statement here. R is the midpoint of segment PS. That is given to us. So this one is a little bit different than our first two given statements. Our first two given statements just told me that I got a pair of congruent sides. I have a pair of congruent sides. But this one didn't really tell me I have a pair of congruent sides. It told, well, it did, but not as direct as the other two did. So if R is the midpoint of PS, we have to recall what does it mean to be a midpoint? Well, a midpoint is the point that is directly in the middle of a segment. And in fact, it can separate that segment in such a way that it creates two new segments that are congruent to each other. So in this case, segment PR and segment RS, or technically segment SR, I accidentally wrote that one wrong. This should actually be segment SR for getting our corresponding parts right. So because R is the midpoint of segment PS, I can then go on to say then that this midpoint creates two new segments from the original. These two segments being PR and SR. So we can say that PR is congruent to SR by the definition of the midpoint. So now at this point, I've exhausted all of my given statements. So let's go through and check. I've got one set of congruent sides, two set of congruent sides, and three set of congruent sides. So, if I've got two triangles that have three sets of congruent sides, then that means that they must be congruent by side, side, side triangle congruency. So, to finish out my statement, again, my proof statement should be my last statement down here. So, it's say, or me, triangle PQR is congruent to triangle STR. And the reason that they are congruent is by side, side, side congruency. All right, now let's look at page two. This is side, side, side proof number two. So we are given L is the midpoint of segment JN and JM is congruent to NM. And with those two pieces of information and this picture provided to us, we need to prove that triangles JLM is congruent to triangle NLM. So we go through like we normally would. We start with our first given statement, which is L is the midpoint of JN, and we write that in our first file. How do we have that statement? It's given to us. So now, is there anything that I can imply, I can pull from this first statement, that L is the midpoint of JN? Well, keep in mind, the definition of a midpoint tells me that it is the point directly in the middle of a segment, and it can cut a segment into two equal parts. So, if L is the midpoint of this segment JN. That means that it is cutting this segment in half. Now, granted, this picture is clearly not cut in half. Let's just go. Okay, it's clearly not cut in half. It's okay. We're going to pretend so. So, when it does that, it does cut it directly in half such that JL will be congruent instead of LN. It will be congruent to NL. Okay, make sure we get our corresponding parts line up right. So my next statement will be that JL is congruent to NL by the definition of a midpoint. Okay, so we've pulled everything we can from that first given statement. Let's look at our next one. 
Jm is congruent to Nm. So, Jm and Nm. Okay, so we know that those two sides are going to be congruent. How do we know that? Because it was given to us. So now I'm out of given statements, but I still haven't determined if these two triangles are congruent or not. The only thing that I know for certain at the moment is that I've got one, two sets of congruent sides. Well, two sets of congruent sides means that it could be side, 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 or it could be side, angle, side, or it could be nothing at all. So let's keep looking. So if we run out of given statements, there's two things we're looking for. Either we need to look for a reflexive side, or we need to look for a pair of vertical angles. Okay, so in this picture, we do have a reflexive side, and it is this side right here, ML. Okay. ML is my reflexive side because I have an ML on the left side. I have an ML on the right side. Basically, if I was to take these two triangles and push them apart, left triangle would have an L or ML or LM. Right triangle would have an ML. So when I make this statement here, ML is congruent to ML, what I'm basically saying is that the ML of the left triangle is congruent to the ML of the right triangle. And how do I have this statement? Because it's the reflexive side, which we can just put reflexive or reflexive property. So now I've got one, two, three sets of congruent sides. That reflexive side does count as a set of congruent sides as well. So because of that, I'm going to have side, side, side triangle congruency to show that triangle JLM is congruent to triangle NLM. All right, so page three, side angle side proof number one. So we are given X is the midpoint of segment VZ, X is the midpoint of segment WY. We need to prove that triangle VWX is congruent to triangle ZYX. So looking here, first segment should be X is the midpoint of segment VZ. That's our first given up here. That's going to be our first statement down here. Our reason that we have that is that it's given to us. So what can I imply from X is the midpoint of VZ, or can I imply anything? Well, if X is the midpoint of VZ, that means X is a point directly in the middle of segment VZ in such a way that it does create two uh, congruent segments. So these congruent segments are VX and ZX. This should actually be ZX. So VX will be congruent to ZX by the definition of a midpoint. Okay, nothing else from that first given statement. Let's move on. Next given statement, X is the midpoint of WY. So again, that means X cuts WY in half. And the two halves that are created are WX and YX. So WX will be congruent to YX, again, by the definition of the midpoint. So now at this point, I have no more given statements, so I need to look for one of two things. I'm either looking for a reflexive side or a pair of vertical angles. Well, it doesn't appear like this triangle has got a reflexive side. It doesn't appear like there is one side of both triangles that they both share. What they do have is a pair of vertical angles right here. Okay, keep in mind vertical angles are two non-adjacent angles that are created by intersecting lines. And so that's exactly what we have right here. So we now have got a pair of vertical angles. So we can say that angle WXV is congruent to angle YXZ because they have vertical angles, because they're vertical angles, the definition of vertical angles. So now we need to determine what how they are congruent okay and this is sometimes something that some people get tripped up by so my one piece of advice i want you to cover up one of the triangles okay so we covered up that triangle on the right so now the parts that we have labeled it's very important that you make sure that you do label this or you're going to mess up the parts that we have labeled in order are side angle side either way you go side angle side side angle side so because of that these two triangles are congruent by side, angle, side. Triangle VWX is congruent to triangle ZYX by side, angle, side congruency. So if you get messed up on how to determine how they're congruent, just cover up one and just name your parts in order. 